Okay, so Tim, do you remember the first property that you bought? Uh, when was it? How much did you pay for it? Yes, I, um, I bought my first block of land in the small country town that I grew up in and uh, in the famous worlds of Daryl Kerrigan. It's probably worth just as much today as what I paid for it back then. <laughs> no, I paid uh, 130000 for a block of land uh, in the small country town of Yay, and I held it for about six years waiting for it to edge up at all. And um, yeah, I eventually sold it uh, at a massive $15,000 profit, which uh, if you take into account all the holding costs, I probably went backwards. <laughs> okay, so not, not an auspicious start. No, not but, a great start. But you learned something from it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the lesson in that was that you, you don't have to buy in the same town that you live in, and there, there are uh, other opportunities if you uh, broaden your horizons a little bit. It's a very important and fundamental lesson for everyone, isn't it? A yeah. lot of people are, seem to be wedded to this idea of buying in their backyard. Yeah. They want to be able to drive by it and look at, look at it mm. rather than considering the whole of Australia as their market. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you, you fast forward to today, uh, I haven't stood in or driven past and waved at any of my investment properties. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your basic philosophy that underpins your property investing today? I think, um, you know, obviously in my line of work, I help people uh, in a lot of different ways and every uh, person you meet has a, a different strategy. So of course, when I'm helping them, I'm looking at different options. But for my personal um, uh, investments, I, I do have a bit of a, a taste for a, a, you know um, some land, like something with a land component, a house being either a three or a four bedroom. And I always like to have a minimum of two bathrooms because I think you get a better rent and better resale value later. I'm not in the, the business of doing renovations and especially if my investment properties are interstate, trying to project manage that from abroad is very difficult. So I have a bit of a, um, a philosophy where I buy good real estate, three or four bedroom, um, two um, bathrooms as a minimum. And um, I always look at the fact that a suburb that you buy in is going to do 80% of the heavy lifting. So I look at location first and property second. Yeah. One of the reasons many people struggle is they don't really have a clear idea of uh, the end game, you yeah. know, the, the end objective. Yeah. Do you have a clear idea of where you're trying to head with property investing? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for me, um, as I said, everybody's strategies are different. And for me and my family, um, you know, we are rent investors at the moment. We love where we live. You know, um, we certainly, I, I don't think we could afford to be living in, uh, like as a mortgagee, wouldn't be able to live in the suburb that we uh, currently live in. But we choose to rent and we have a lot of investment properties. And the end goal for us is that we will use those investment properties to hopefully get into that owner occupier at a much smaller mortgage uh, in the future. So, um, so down some investment properties to get a bigger deposit. Some investors buy and sell property. Um, do you think that's the way to go? Or should people buy good property, keep it and accumulate a portfolio? Yeah, again, each to their own. I think um, you can make a lot of money by, you know, buying a property, renovating it, um, you know, the, the flip it uh, type model, but um, that's not for me. <laughs> I like to, uh, I've got a bit more of a buy and hold strategy. I always look for properties that I can manufacture a bit of growth in. So looking for property that where it just might need a cosmetic change, like a, a lick of paint, some new carpets, a render on the front of the house, where you can get quite a bit of uplift with a little amount of spend. Yeah. So. As you know, the statistics show that there are over 2 million Australians who own an investment property, yeah. but fewer than 1% actually get to five or more and actually have what you might call a portfolio. Why do you think that is? What, what's holding people back? What, why is it that 90% have only one or two properties? Yeah, look, um, it's, it's well documented that um, people struggle to get past the first one, and that's because either A, they bought the wrong property, but more importantly, I think they've got the finance wrong. If you don't get the finance right and you understand how to leverage correctly, you're never going to get past um, step one. So people often overcapitalize, they spend too much on their first investment property. And if you think about it, um, for a lot of investors, they've still got a mortgage on their own home. So if they have their own home, that's the debt that they should be focusing on paying off. And if you're focusing on paying off your owner occupier, you're not paying off any debt on the investment property, which means you're probably paying interest only. And even if you do get good uh, uplift on um, the investment, you're not able to go again because your debt is still quite high. So I'm always a big believer that you've got to get the finance right first. And if you don't structure it correctly, trying to replicate um, you know, the process and buying multiple properties is going to be very difficult. Well, that's a great segue into the next question, which is the importance of getting um, good advice and good information. I find a lot of investors want to penny pinch their way to successful in property. They'll borrow money and buy, spend the big money on the piece of real estate, but are, they're reluctant to spend on advice yeah. and information. It's a fundamental problem, I think. Yeah. 
Oh, I tend to agree. I think um, when you take into account what it costs you for the right advice, you know, it's a, a drop in the ocean compared to getting the investment wrong. You know, um, I can tell you through my own personal experience of buying um, the wrong property uh, first up, that cost me six years. You know, for outside of dollar value, it cost me six years of opportunity cost where I could have been, you know, investing in other locations. So I, uh, I'd hate to even put a figure on what that cost me. If I had spent, you know, back then $10,000 on uh, some good advice, so I think I'd be in a much better position today. Yeah. So one of the fundamental pieces of advice we give at Hot Spotting is build your team before you build your portfolio because you talked a little bit about the importance of doing that yeah and how, well, you, how you can do it well i think about if you think about it, elite sports people if you think about anybody in business no one does it on their own you need you know specialty people that can help you with their chosen field and um likewise with um you know sporting uh, people they have somebody who's going to help with their uh, health and conditioning it might be some for um mindset you know people go and seek professional advice and i don't know why australians especially don't like paying for that type of advice to get their financial position better. You know, um, the way that we look at it, your um, the assets and liabilities is like a report card. And for a lot of Australians, you know, if you were to look at their assets and liabilities, it's not even a B plus. And I think it's quite easy to go out and find a way that you can improve your financial situation, but without paying for the right advice, you probably find that you're gonna continue on the same path. So in terms of building your team before you build your portfolio, what, what are some of the, the professionals that you should have on your team, people that you can regularly go to that you trust for good advice? Yeah, look, the first one I would say is mortgage broker is incredibly important. I think, um, you know, people tend to lend lend on their um, their favourite bank. I always call them the dolomite factor. You know, I um, personally was a, a dolomite. The Commonwealth Bank got me nice and young, but it wasn't until I started working in real estate and started to realise that there was, you know, other options out there. And a mortgage broker opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, there's no point being loyal to your bank because they're not really that loyal with you. So you'll go out and you'll uh, the mortgage broker will do all the running around for you. you don't even pay them a fee for that because the bank pays them um, but they will identify the best structure uh, for you to be able to uh, to meet your goals they'll also be able to ensure that you've got the most competitive rates and the, the best um, you know lender out there for what you're trying to achieve yeah the next one would obviously be um, structure so the um, the entity that you're buying in you need a good accountant for that and then when it comes to the real estate you know you really need to know that you're you know the next purchase that you're about to make is the best option for you in this time in this market and that might mean that you're not looking local you're looking interstate you're looking at diversifying into other locations yeah uh, quantity surveyor depreciation yeah depreciation is important as well i mean um, i think there's a bit of a myth that um, uh, you can only get good depreciation on an existing uh, sorry on a new build um, it is true that it's um, far higher on a new build because of the fixtures and fittings, but you can depreciate an established property for up to 40 years. So uh, making sure that you've paid for a good depreciation schedule from a qualified surveyor is incredibly important because you'll be saving a lot in tax. What about just the simple concept of a mentor? Yeah, I think um, I don't know anybody in um, you know the one percent, not just of investors, or um, but also you know elite um, business people. They all have mentors, so I think it's incredibly important. And um, you know, if you think that you you know everything, you're um, you're not going to grow. Yeah. So I know we've touched on it already, but if we could talk a little bit more about the importance of getting that first one right, mm -hmm. and how much of a barrier it is if you get it wrong. Um. Yeah, well, I can tell you one of my mentors wrote a book called uh, Brick by Brick. And, um, you know, he talks about um, laying the foundation for your property investment. It's very true. If you think about it, like building anything, if you don't get the foundation right, it's going to topple over. And I think um, in terms of property investment, that first property, that first brick that you um, build is incredibly important because it's a cornerstone of whether you're going to be able to replicate that. Yeah. Um, what kind of barriers can be thrown up if you get the first one wrong? Yeah, first one wrong could mean, you know, you're upside down, you've um, you got negative equity, which is hard to get out of because not only, um, you know, not only are you, have you got an asset that's worth less than you paid for it, you know, sometimes you can't even refinance again. It can put you in all sorts of problems, uh, especially if you aren't able to make uh, the repayments on that and you need to sell it quickly, you know, you can end up uh, in a worse position than you started. Um, the other, um, the flip side of that is if you were to buy a property that, um, you know, is in a location where you can't get tenants and things like that, you're all of a sudden in a position where you've got a property that's costing you money instead of making you money. So if you could go back in time, what advice would you give to the 25 year old Tim Graham? 
The 25-year-old Tim Graham would be, um, yes, go and get advice, a lot of it, um, ask a lot of questions, never stop asking questions, and um, you know, don't jump at the first thing you see. Um, you may have answered this question already, but what major mistake have you made with some of your early investments that you would like people out there starting out not to, re to replicate? I think the first one was obviously buying in my uh, small local town where um, you know I didn't see growth for a long time. And the second one would be, um, you know, I set up a family trust for um, our family, but I did that prior to starting my investment properties. And it's a very expensive exercise to go and move them because you have st stamp duty implications and things like that. So um, if I had gone out and uh, sought good accounting advice from the beginning, again, I'd be in a much better position from a structure perspective. So I wouldn't make that mistake again. What are the biggest myths and myths conceptions that people seem to have about property investment? I think for Australians, we, we believe that you need quite a lot of money to go into um, in investing in the first place or even buying your own home. And again, I know we've talked about advice a lot and going and getting, um, seeking the right advice, but there's so many different financial products out there now and government assistance that people can get into the market a lot easier than they may think. But in the media, we're just hearing that it's impossible. You know, the cost of living and the affordability and everything, but it's possible for any Australian um, who's got an income of over 80,000 and maybe savings of even 30,000 um, to be able to tap into some government assistance or even uh, guarantor loans through parents. There's a lot of different ways that you can do it. And there's even fractional ownership opportunities in Australia now for real estate. So I think, um, you know, don't believe everything that you hear in the media, I think go out and find out for yourself because it's probably a lot easier than you expect.